Hello, welcome to PQ, the one and only Pokemon Q podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Martin, brought to you with Connor Lavelle. So we're here with episode four. Isn't that crazy, Connor? Yeah, it, uh, it's been four episodes. We've been consistent the whole time. I feel like uh, getting things off the ground is always one of the most difficult things. So good to see that we've made it this far. Yeah, and now we're on a weekly schedule, so I hope you all will appreciate the uh, influx of more episodes. We're definitely excited to be uh, you know, making content more consistently. Um, how is Cube League going on your side? I'm 2-2. Two, two. I am 3-1. and one. I, uh, I won my last round. It was pretty, I don't know, uneventful. I just got up really fast. Game 1, he didn't really get up very well at all. Game 2, he wasn't able to deal with... Uh, with my stuff at the rate that I was able to get it in play. I think I had nine energy in play on turn three in uh, in game two. So that kind of <laughs> indicates how uh, how things went. Sounds like it sounds like things went pretty well. Yeah, yeah, definitely no complaints. What record do you need for top eight then? Is it like four and one or? So four-oh? it's six rounds, so four and two will be on the bubble most four and twos will make it in if not all of them i think it will be a bubble though um i have really good resistance so odds are i'll be just fine even if i do go four and two but uh one more win and i'll be feeling pretty good does cube league do ties like ids or anything they do not no we so I understand IDs and I understand the case for them and you know I've ID'd myself in in competitive events but since cube is a fun format and there are no like tangible prizes on the line we don't do IDs. I guess it would also be kind of hard to tie right because there's no real time limit you have on your games just kind of pick a time play your games out you know as long as it's before the deadline. Exactly there are no natural ties so it, it can really disrupt the event as far as you know possible standings and who makes top eight and um it it definitely feels like you earn it if you make top eight in cube league just because you've actually had to play out all your games for sure so you're looking for about one more win to uh sort of be on that bubble spot yeah one more win and i'll feel pretty good if i can get two more then i'll feel great because that means i'll probably have a an easier matchup going into top eight um, there have been a lot of Sceptile decks doing really well, which is great for me because uh, I'm playing Fire. So the uh, my ability to deal with decks like that is is pretty solid. So I'm hoping that I can get a couple of those and maybe get a little bit lucky on matchups. That would be pretty nice. Yeah, no, I'm definitely hoping to win uh, win out from here. I mean, two two. I mean, win two more. You know. <laughs> so yeah, it, I mean, spot, it's so we're we're still in good. We're still in good spot. <laughs> your your deck is good, so it should be be should be very doable. Yeah, Kindra's nuts. I mean, like, I, I really enjoy it. I think just, like, Legends of Wake Kindra, like, Dragon Pump just feels really strong, and having EVs is a lot of fun, so can't complain. Definitely happy with what I have and having fun playing it. Yeah, Legends of Wake and Kingdra is definitely the one of the most powerful single prize attackers in the cube, so. Yeah, and, okay, so I guess we should move on to this uh, crack a pack and this will be our last crack a pack on your cube, at least for right now. So we'll be transitioning cubes in the next episode. But, Connor, you got a pack ready you want to talk about? I do indeed. All right, so this is uh, the last pack that we're going to be pulling from my cube, and then we're going to switch for next episode. Um, here I have a pack that Andrew and I both thought was pretty interesting, so I'm excited to go over it. Uh, the cards in order are Riolu, it has Kick for 20, uh, Professor Elm, the early one, shuffle your hand into your deck, draw 7, you can't play any more trainers. In this cube, that's Trainer Supporter Stadium, that's all of them. Um, Sage's Training, look at your top 5, take 2, discard the rest. Uh, there's a Lampant, a Magmar, I'm not going to focus too much on the evolving basics. There is Spear Tomb from Arceus, one of the most powerful setup Pokemon that's ever existed. Uh, there is Acerola, Lucario from Mysterious Treasures, I believe, um, Focus Blast, 1 for 30 anywhere, and then Spiked Lariat can deal 3 for 60 or 3 for 80, pretty solid. Mysterious Treasure, very powerful card for Psychic or uh, no real Dragon types in this cube, but Psychic types for sure. Um, Zerosic, Disruptive Supporter, uh, Rare Candy, Delcaddy from Ruby and Sapphire, very powerful draw engine. 
Premier Ball for that level X search or recovery. Uh, Suicune from Secret Wonders. It has a power Aqua Recover, lets you return three water Pokemon from your discard to your hand when you bench it. And the last one is Lieutenant Surge's Electabuzz. Wow, that's a pretty solid pack we got here. I think I, I would definitely be really happy to see this pack on my first on my, this is my first pack of the cube. Yeah, you definitely won't be sad to have to pick uh, from among these cards, but uh, you might be a little bit sad to actually have to make the decision, which is why we picked this pack. Yeah, I mean, like, so, I mean, personally, I'm just torn between Elm and Delcaddy, um, because Delcaddy with Energy Draw is a really good draw in general. Like, uh, there's a lot of decks that can utilize it very well. Um, Elm, uh, again, solid draw card. I mean, just be able to shuffle draw seven. Granted, there's a bit of a you know drawback to it. You can't play any trainers, but I mean, like still, I can, if I'm just looking for energy or Pokemon, like it's still fine. So I don't know which one I would pick. I'm I'm thinking I'd pick Delcaddy. I think that that would be my pick. Yeah, so it's it's a really tricky play, and there are a couple of cards that stand out too. Um, I think the Spiritomb from Arceus stands out. Uh, Acerola might stand out to some players mm -hmm. just because it's so powerful on the um, on the prize denial front. Um, but I agree that Elm and Delcaddy are my top two. Uh, Elm, just being able to shuffle your hand into your deck and draw seven, dig seven mm -hmm. cards deeper, um, no drawback of discarding anything. It's totally lossless. The only thing is that your turn, as far as trainers and supporters go, is pretty much over at that point. But if you just need Pokemon and Energy, which a lot of the time that's what you're trying to draw into with your supporters, then Elm is really good. Um, and then Delcaddy is one of the most powerful draw engines ever. Uh, discard any energy to draw three. You can do that every single turn. Uh, that card was in many, many decks. And in cube, it is an absolute powerhouse. I think in this case, I agree with you that I would go with Delcaddy because the biggest thing in cube with Delcaddy is just having a deck that's capable of really taking advantage of it every single turn. So if you start with this Delcaddy, like if you start the draft first pick Delcaddy, then you know you're going to have tons and tons of opportunities to get the cards that are going to allow you to energy draw and attach every turn. Things like Energy Recycler, Powerful Recovery in general. Um, more specifically, you could get the Platinum Delcaddy or the Mantine Delta Species that allow you to put energy back on top of your deck. Um, there are so many different reasons, there's so many different ways that you can enable your Delcaddy. And if you get it first pick, then you can pretty much guarantee you're going to get one. Yeah, you know what's interesting? Something I'm thinking about as you're talking. And if I saw this pack, like, maybe three cycles later, like maybe we're in like the fourth set of packs, I might be inclined to take the Elm. Yeah, I think at that point it would depend really heavily on your draft, I agree. Right. Um, if, you all, if you already have the really strong recovery base, or maybe if you've just got really strong search and your deck is pretty well outlined already, you don't have a lot of need for a ton of other cards, then I would go into the Delcaddy probably because, you know, you have time still to pick up the recovery um you you can essentially get what you need to make it work at that point but if your deck is uncertain um if you negatively interact with powers in any way if you're super aggressive maybe um then there are definitely some compelling reasons to take the elm instead it just right. really depends on what you've already got yeah i know so like i mean pretending this was the first pack of the cube that i just got i i for me, I just feel like having some sort of like Pokemon line that draws you cards is just really important. So I tend to prioritize those pretty heavy anyway. So like Delcaddy itself just seems like something I'd like to have access to right away. Um, especially if I don't know if I'm going to see uh, Claydol or Porygon in this cube. And it also makes it a little bit easier to get like the Skitty in the cube too because you have a lot more time to take it as opposed to like um, seeing Delcaddy late and then you don't have any Skitties. But... <laughs> Uh, hopefully by this point you've kept track of at least maybe remember how many skitties you've seen but you know it's a lot less risky to take it now and i don't know i just feel like having energy draw or any sort of draw ability in your in your deck it's just gonna like make your strategy more consistent as opposed to just having like a draw trainer like i feel like i'm gonna get more cards off energy draw than i will off elm if that makes sense 
Yeah, it's just so good. It it helps you set up. It keeps you consistent through the mid game. It allows you to really take advantage of utility supporters, which is something that I don't really see talked about that much. Um, in general, Del Caddy can let you use things like Acerola, AZ, uh, Briny, Lysander, anything that doesn't draw or search you cards. It can allow you to use that really, really well. Uh, and and those kinds of effects win you the game. You know they are they are extremely powerful, and being able to use those and stay consistent at the same time, it's a really incredible upside. It also makes you resistant to your opponent's disruption as well. If they end you low, maybe play reset stamp, Marnie, anything like that that would restrict your number of options. Being able to turn an energy you might draw into three fresh cards is going to mean that your likelihood of drawing out of that is going to be much higher. Yeah, it's funny you brought that up because I remember uh, in week one of the Champions Cube, I was watching uh, commenting over Omnipoke's game. Um, I forget which one, but uh, he was his engine basically had like Star Raptor level X and um, Fade All. And you're right, he's able to use these uh, tech supporters. So he would obviously have Cosmic Flower uh, being able to draw, refill his hand. But then at the same time, he would use Star Raptor level X, which lets you just pull a supporter from your deck. And he so he'd go like stuff like Flare Gun, Cosmic Flower, or he'd go like. Wally into Mighty Anna because he had Skunk Tank G to use the free attack and then uh and then draw. So yeah, having like draw abilities just really opens up your deck to being able to play more options. It also like reminds me of Zorark GX, like when that was a deck back in uh 2018, 2017. Um, where they would just trade a bunch and then like, you know, play like some sort of supporter like Acerola or Guzma. Um, because they, they already have the cards in hand and it allows them to open up more. Um so like having those options where you're not just having to like Dump, it, dump your hand with a supporter and then draw and then that's kind of it like you know able to play cards like acerola can be game changing so having that option with stuff like energy draw um we're not dependent on the supporter you're right it's definitely uh undervalued i think for one and then also just really good yeah and and it can change the way that you draft and it can open up a lot of possibilities for you too so very very good to keep in mind yeah this is an interesting pack because I, I mean i feel like i like the shamans like i don't I don't think if 100 people saw this pack, um, everyone would take Delcaddy. Um, I mean, you can make arguments for Delcaddy for Elm, maybe even Spiritomb, uh, possibly Treasure, but uh, I definitely think probably Delcaddy, Elm, and Spiritomb are like the top three. I could see an argument for Acerola as well. Um, mm. Depending on what kind of player you are, depending on what kind of decks you might have seen in advance that you're trying to gun for. Um, or even maybe you just really like the card. I could see Acerola being a strong pickup here. However, it is definitely something that you're going to have to think about <laughs> no matter what. So uh, I think this pack was a pretty good example of some of the difficult decisions you might have to make early on. Yeah, and uh, I mean, you're absolutely right. So I think this is going to be it for this crack a pack And, you know, Connor, thanks for lending your cube for these segments. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what cube we do next. We haven't figured out which one yet, but um you'll be you'll we'll know you'll know when we know right <laughs> so um make yeah, sure you stick definitely. around what'd you say oh, i just agreed yeah definitely <laughs> right um so uh we have a we have a big episode to get through today we've been talking about uh building and playing now so we've gone through every other part about cube from what it is to how to draft now we're going to get into the last part is how to actually build your deck and how to play it <laughs> so uh stick around we'll be right back All right, welcome back. So, like I said at the end of the previous segment, we've talked about pretty much everything about Q from, like, what it is to how to build one and how to draft. Now it gets to the last part of it, how to actually build and play your deck, uh, which can be simple, but also there's a lot of nitty-gritty parts that get into it. So hopefully you'll see what uh, we mean when we get uh, further into this episode. So um, building your deck actually starts with the draft because unlike standard or constructed, uh, you have to, you know, draft the cards you're going to build with, you know, which makes sense. So you want to make sure whatever you're, you know, drafting in your, you know, when you're, when you're going through the draft, you're thinking about, okay, these cards are going into my deck. What am I going to do with these cards? Um, so you, you gotta, if you don't have a lot of good cards to work with, once you get to the end of the draft, that's going to be a uh, red flag right there. But let's just assume, you know, you listen to the last week's episode and you have a great draft pool to work with. Connor, where do we go from here? We have all these cards in front of us that we expertly picked because we listened to the last episode. So. <laughs> you, you picked with the guidance that we gave you last time. Um, 
Yeah, right. so so a, a cube deck, a good one, had basically has some core elements, and then it has some some additional elements. We'll say for now, uh, there's a lot more detail to go into on that, but that's essentially you have your baseline of your deck that you need for it to function, and then you have the other stuff that you want to have in your deck for one reason or another. So uh, sense, you that that core is essentially your Pokemon, your trainers. And your energy and you know that's that's obvious but in a in a more specific sense it is your primary line or lines it's your consistency and it's the energy that you need to attack and there are important differences between energy that you need to attack and energy that might have useful effects that you might not be able to get that much out of in certain situations things like rescue energy really powerful card warp energy uh, call energy, all these things that have super powerful effects you want to put in your deck. However, if they are going to prevent you from being able to use your attacks that require colored energy, then it might be time to look at potentially cutting those cards or making some more space for colored energy elsewhere. Uh, so those are those are kind of your trifecta, your main line, consistency, the energy that you need to attack. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think something, too, just to throw it out there, is if you're coming from, like, maybe standard, um, where you have cards like Welder or attacks like Full Blitz or Ultimate Ray, um, you, you want to consider that, like, uh, in Cube, you're generally going to get maybe one attachment, maybe two, depending on how your deck's built. Um, so energy does matter. Uh, like, a Call Energy is a great card, but it's only a colorless energy. So if your attack takes three Lightning Energies to, <laughs> to go with, um, you got to think about game tempo at that point, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is definitely something to think about. And it's much higher level, I would say, than a lot of the other things we've talked about so far on the show. But um, it is something that you really have to think about. Like, is this call energy actually going to be able to help me attack? Because if it's a search two basics, it's not bad by any means. Like, call energy is probably one that I would put in almost no matter what. But um, say, like, uh, like, a rescue will warp um, things that you know, if they don't turn into an attack, then you might have to increase your energy line. You might have to cut other cards, like count the warp energy as a switch instead of as an energy, count the call energy as a search two basics instead of an energy, uh, things like that. In especially decks that have really heavy colored requirements, it's going to be important to do. And it's going to be something that's very easy to overlook when you're building your deck. So something I think that's interesting, I mean, about cube and the you know, constructive is uh, you have unlimited card pool in terms of what you draft is what you can play. So um, a lot of new players, I mean, especially if you're, you're coming into this and you're very focused on drafting, you know, the line you want and you end up getting like the whole eight, six, four line, just say like, you know, I think the first thing you got to consider is how much of that do you actually need? Like, do you have any tips on like how to like maybe like um, structure your lines in a way? Like, do you play all of your basics or do you maybe just play a four, four, four line or what do you think? Yeah, and then that that kind of comes back to the core of the of the deck. Um, it your core needs to be what you need for your deck to work. It doesn't necessarily need to be everything that you have. So an eight six four line, you know, you're you're gonna get your basics. That's great, but you know, you might have like as many as six extra cards in there that you could cut for something else, depending on what else you have. So if you let's say have you really good recovery or you have lots of different attackers then you probably don't need to play that full count of basics or if you have a lot of rare candies then you don't need to play that many stage ones things like that places that you can cut and gain extra space are going to be tremendously beneficial as you move forward because it's going to allow you to fit the cards into your deck that you really want and the cards that really allow you to win while still staying consistent while still functioning every time uh, pretty much everything is is predicated on that. Like you know, your deck needs to work first, but mm. um, that that core doesn't necessarily need to be eight six four. It it could be four four four. Um, I'm playing a deck in Team Cube right now. Uh, I guess spoilers for my opponents or <laughs> spoilers for my team on my opponents, uh, Andrew. I guess this could negatively affect you slightly, but uh, I have a five Fine. two four line. Uh, in the core of my team cube deck right now because I've got a pretty heavy rare candy count. 
So it really just, it, but I've drafted like full seven, six, four line, something like that. So, you know, finding that space is, is really important. And your core does not always necessarily mean every single thing that you have that could go into it. I think it makes sense. It will definitely um, come back to, uh, you know, making those cuts at the very end. But I'm glad you brought that up because I also think that affects, uh, and I know this is an episode about building, not drafting, but you know, as you said before, draft is part of the build in a sense. So when you're drafting your, your deck, essentially, um, and you're thinking about how many, you know, Pokemon you need, obviously I think the line toppers are pretty obvious to grab for the stage twos if you're playing a stage two deck. Like, um, But I think where some players maybe get tripped up at is, okay, do I really need like a six, the sixth copy of my stage one if I already am playing and I'm playing four? Um, so those are the things you consider is when you're drafting too is okay, how many of this am I actually gonna play? Um, you're right, some of it will probably wheel, but um, you know when you're seeing cards come through here and you know you don't need to necessarily be um, if your deck doesn't require like six of the one basic, you don't need to be aggressive drafting six of the one basic if you already have you know what you need. So um, I definitely think consider what cards like that end up in your deck and how that's gonna affect your build. Um, trainers too. I think um, you you quoted a number last time uh, for trainers like draw support. What was that? Fifteen. Yeah, as far as draw and search, I really like to see fifteen as a minimum. Uh, a lot of the time, I'm gonna shoot for closer to twenty, but fifteen is kind of where I'm like, okay, as long as my needs are not crazy, my deck is gonna set up okay. Um, once you get up into like the 20, you know, you start to feel pretty good. You're like, okay, yeah, like my, my deck is going to work for sure. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. And then obviously, um, energy is the weird one, right? Because I feel like if we might've said this last episode where people generally, when they start out, put way less energy than what they actually need. Um, because I think we get used to this idea of like, oh, well, if I put like 10 or 11 energies. I'm fine because I mean, I play that in my Pikaram deck. But like in cube, you don't really have access to all the tools that you have <laughs> um, in standard. And then also the games take way longer. So like you're you're setting up like six attackers almost as opposed to like two or three. Uh, and honestly, you need like 30 energy. But like I think like what, 15 to 16 is probably what you're aiming for here, right? I like I like 14 in most decks. It's kind of yeah. like 14, 15. It's kind of where I try to aim. Um yeah. It, it does vary a lot, though. It depends on your attack costs. It depends on your recovery needs. It depends on how many utility energy you have versus how many energy, that, like colored energy basic that you're playing. Um, so I'm playing, gosh, 17 energy, 16, 17 energy in Team Cube this month because all of my attackers have huge attack costs. Um, but yeah, and I'm kind of on the other end of that in a... Uh, um where I'm probably playing like maybe 10 or 11 because Kingdra attacks for one energy. So I definitely understand what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like in uh, in March or February, I played nine just because I had free uh, attackers that attacked for free and the rest of my attackers attacked for like one or two. So, uh, it, and it, it also depends on your consistency a lot. Something that uh, Mike Gibbs did in the league was he had a really poor consistency line in a deck and he ramped up his energy count. And what that allowed him to do is essentially every single Pokemon that he was able to draw into, he was able to set up an attack with. And he did pretty well. That was that was in Champions Cube last time where he made top four. So um, it, it was something that would have been very easy to like try and slot some extra Pokemon or something into. But he identified, you know, that he was going to have plenty of Pokemon and he needed the energy and the Pokemon at the end of the day, even if his supporter line was weak, then he would be able to win games that way. And, he, and that was true. He did win a lot of games that way just off of Pokemon and energy. So it uh, it's something that varies a lot and you definitely need more than you think. I know we've talked about it before. I'm sure we'll say it many, many times in the future, but you need more energy than you think. Yeah, and that kind of brings into the next thing that um, sort of embodies that same idea is recovery. And I feel like recovery is like, at least to like a novice player, it tends to be underdrafted, wouldn't you say? Oh, yes. <laughs> I would put uh, Rescue Stretcher and Super Rod Night Maintenance up at like top tier picks. Um, just super, super powerful item-based recovery. 
so incredibly powerful in cube cannot be underestimated uh, every single deck is going to benefit from it it literally does not matter in the slightest what you are playing your deck is going to be better with recovery because you're going to be able to use your best cards more and that is one of the things that's going to allow you to win uh, and, and playing a deck without recovery can be really scary because if you play a supporter that forces you to discard, if you lose a Pokemon unexpectedly, whether your opponent discards it out of your hand, maybe your opponent has extra reach on a knockout that you didn't realize and they take a knockout on a Pokemon that you really need, if you don't have a way to get that back, then a lot of the time that can turn into a loss. But if you do have ways to get that back, well, then either it's not a big deal or you can even play keeping that in mind. For example, if I'm playing... 15 energy and i have two or three energy recovery cards say i'm playing delcaddy well i know it's not a big deal for me to throw away a couple of energy because i will be able to get them back just fine i mean nothing feels worse than having to ditch like a basic energy or two and being like okay i can only attack five times now <laughs> like and mm -hmm. i've been there i think a lot of people have been there especially when they're getting uh, newer to cube uh so definitely something that you need to think about recovery is of utmost importance no matter what you are playing yeah i think no, i mean you're right nothing feels worse than like you have one prize left to take and you could win on your turn but you just don't have the energy in your deck to do it like i've been there before too and it just feels so bad because then you start thinking back man if that one turn i wouldn't describe that energy i would win but nope i mean if you don't have recovery you just you can't do anything about it um, also with cube too, you're also dealing with, you know, you have a large array of different cards. So like your attackers could be four unique um, Pokemon and not just like four of the same. So you have to consider like what that does for your deck. You're not, you want to give yourself as many opportunities to play your most optimal attackers. So if, um, and having recovery enables you to do that because if you think of a card like Rescue Stretcher, um, that card in your discard pile is now retrievable very easily. But it's not then you don't have access to it for the rest of the game so you have to consider like how that's going to work in the long haul and i think again i'm gonna keep reiterating this you have a lot of turns that you're gonna have to deal with in cube um especially since you're only dealing with usually just one prize at a time uh, that's like six different knockouts you're gonna have to commit to so the amount of work that takes as compared to maybe knocking out something like a tag team or a v max i mean it's a, a lot different and you got to be prepared for that Um, so there's the other part of like what goes in your deck and a lot of it's like power cards, right? So like your reset stamps, your maybe your gust cards or um, cards that are just your you know, game winners. Uh, like what kind of like maybe how much like do you usually like include like a certain amount of those or like do you allow space for those cards to be in your deck or is it kind of like fluid depending on what strategy you're going for? I, I would say it's pretty fluid. I I'm never going to have a deck where I'm like, oh, yes, I need to play like X number of gust healing like anything like that like i'm not necessarily shooting right. for an amount i'm essentially especially in the draft thinking about you know how is my consistency what am i going to be able to play regularly like i mean if you need to play a draw supporter every single turn because that's all the consistency you've got your draw supporters are kind of weak you don't have anything super strong like that then it is definitely going to be important to not overtake those those can or those utility cards those game winners as andrew said um however they are what allow you to oftentimes win games play in ways that your opponent are not is not prepared for uh and and in that way they can allow you to gain an advantage that you could not have gained in any other way so talking about uh, gust cards being the most powerful of them but um, energy removal cards can be very powerful. Um, healing cards are ones that I see featured very, very often in cubes that just win games so much. Um, scoop up effects like Acerola, Briny's Compassion, things like that. Cards that allow you to deny prizes in that way. Um, so really, cards that allow you to deny prizes from your opponent by making your Pokemon harder to knock out cards that allow you to deny prizes from your opponent by making their Pokemon less able to attack, and cards that allow you to attack the Pokemon that your opponent least wants you to attack. Those are kind of the three big categories, I would say, that, uh, that you're kind of looking at with the game winners. And you 
generally want to put as many of those in your deck as you can afford. Like if I have a Pokemon Center Lady, an AZ, uh, an Acerola, a Lysander, like I want to put all the four of those cards in the deck. And it's just a matter of figuring out how I'm going to get there and thinking about how my strategy might work out. So, you know, I'm never going to drop a Lysander. But if I'm looking at AZ and it's like, well, all my Pokemon have really high attack costs. Uh, I don't have a ton of ways or any ways to move energy around. Like I'm going to lose a lot when I play this AZ and my deck is not fast enough to really take advantage of it, well, then it might be a decent cut just because even though that effect is very powerful, it doesn't fit your deck. And ultimately, everything comes back to how well it fits your deck. Yeah, I definitely I definitely agree. Um, so when you get done with the draft, I mean, I, I don't know how everyone else does it. For me, I like, um, well, it's a little bit different now that we play on Google Sheets, but like if we were playing in person, I like to just sort my cards like um, quickly. So like, Pokemon and like supporters items and then um, maybe special energies and stuff and then kind of see what I have to work with. I tend to like kind of sort in my head like these like different categories like um, I have my consistency, my like my draw and my search or my power cards like the ones we just mentioned um, and then Pokemon I have like you know the lines that I'm going to play and then I also have options for like supporting Pokemon like maybe I have a Uxie or I have like a Gel Caddy line. Um, do you do anything like that? Do you like maybe sort your draft either in your head or in your, you know, maybe in your Google sheet? Like what's your approach before you start building? I'm pretty neurotic as far as sorting actually. Um, like I, <laughs> I even like sort my hand in games. Like it's a habit that I've done for years, uh, probably like at least seven or eight years now. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I sort my cards like kind of to a ridiculous extent, I would say, but definitely you want to, you want to break them down into the biggest categories, um, like your Pokemon, your trainers, your energy, and then, you know, break down your trainer line into like supporters, items, stadiums, and then you can break down into like, um, consistency versus utility and, uh, you know, break your Pokemon and down into lines or types or whatever helps you organize it the most but uh, organization is definitely paramount to actually putting together your deck it's going to allow you to see all your cards in the most effective way for you to understand how they're going to come together in the end like if you have you know if you have a big jumbled up pile and you're going through and you you know see some supporters and you're like okay i've got supporters then the actual number there could be pretty misrepresented. Uh, you know, you might have looked through and seen quite a few supporters. You're like, oh yeah, I've got supporters. And it turns out you've got like 18 and you could be cutting a couple of the weaker mm -hmm. ones for other cards. Uh, alternatively, you could be like, oh yeah, I saw some supporters in there and you could have like seven. Uh, so really laying it out, whether it's in person, sorting it in the Google sheet, tabletop, whatever, sort your cards, really give yourself the advantage as far as organization and seeing all your cards in the right way before you start making decisions as far as like exactly what you're going to put in. Yeah, I just find that this helps you also approach it with like a clearer head. Because I know for me, like if I have like all my cards, like all jumbled up, like I have no idea what I'm working with here. <laughs> um, and I'll forget like, oh, I actually drafted a Cleffa and then it just won't end up in my deck and I'll be really sad because Cleffa's a great card. Um, stuff like that. And especially I think supporters, um, if you don't know what you have, it's hard to figure out what, you know, which ones you want to put in your deck because you might forget that you have something like a good card, like Mentor or something, uh, which might, you know, help you leverage some like, you know, power cards that maybe we're going to throw in your deck instead. And, um, so yeah, definitely agree. Organization, I mean, in general, good strat. Make sure you guys keep track of what you have. Um, so then you kind of just kind of, I don't want to say paint by numbers because that's not really what it is, but you know, you have an idea of, like, what Pokemon you're going to need in your deck and the trainers you want to put in. Um, and, you know, I feel like what happens is, um, and I hear, I've, I've yet to draft and not heard this come up. Oh, my gosh, I'm at 60 cards and I haven't even put energy yet. <laughs> you know? Like, I feel like I, feel like I say that, that every life. time. <laughs> yeah. I don't think, I mean, honestly, I don't think I've, I've ever gone through a draft and someone hasn't had that problem. I have that problem, right? Um, yeah, and that's really the fun part, right? Well, I say fun in quotes. I mean, it's it's the hard. I think for me, it's the hardest part about building, and that is making your last cuts. Um, trimming the fat is another way to think about. It. I mean, like that's really hard because if you have like sixty great cards and you have to fit fifteen energies in there, like that's fifteen cuts. Um, like where do you where do you even start when you're when you get in that situation? 
Yeah, I mean, trimming the fat is is the ultimate test of your deck building abilities at the end of the day in cube. It's it's easy, comparatively at least, to go from 80 cards to 60 cards. But going from 60 cards to 45 cards is much harder. <laughs> because in those 15 cards between 60 and 45, you have cards that are better than the ones that you've already taken out. So the there is a lot of thinking to do there. Um and the first thing that I always like to uh, em emphasize, reinforce, um, throughout the entire decision-making process is always keep in mind exactly what your deck aims to do. Uh, it, it can be really easy to get carried away in some cards, you know, like, uh, like Crushing Hammer, Team Flare Grunt. Those cards are very good. But if your deck is super aggressive or if it's really combo heavy and you need as much space as possible or you know anything like that then those kinds of cards are not necessarily going to be the best for you on the contrary if you have a team flare grunt and you have lots of ways to get it back and your deck is either going to play a control game or you're going to be able to take advantage of cards like Claydol, like delcaddy and you might not need your supporter every turn well those cards get a lot better you, you might try and make your cuts somewhere else so Always, always think about your core strategy as you play or as you as you build your deck. Yeah, I mean, like, this is like the number one point to make because I, I think what happens with science with players is like, okay, maybe I drafted the septile line in this cube and I have all the septiles, but I'm not thinking about what the deck actually does. Like maybe it's at nursery and heal and it's trying to put a lot of energy to play. Um, but like, you know, I'm just throwing septiles in there and I'm throwing like all the really cool supporters I have, but I'm not really thinking about my game plan. You kind of just inadvertently end up with the best without really you know trying to just because like if your deck doesn't have like synergizing pieces like maybe you forgot to put in some way to retreat your celebi prime <laughs> to attach energy or something like or think about stuff like that um you put yourself ultimately at a disadvantage um so Connor's absolutely right you definitely want to think about first what is my deck trying to do because if your deck isn't doing that thing um uh, we have a problem right um so, and, that, and that's going to play itself to, well, one, how you draft it. And then now when you have this, like, you have to make these cuts, uh, you should be evaluating cards now on, okay, is this actually helping me achieve whatever strategy I'm going for? Yeah, and does this contribute to my strategy? Does this contribute to my game plan? And, and that can extend in a couple of ways, too. Um, you know, cool lines of utility cards, we've already talked about a little bit. They, you know, things like Team Flare Grunt don't fit your strategy. They can hurt more than they can help because in the worst case, they are a dead card. Or in, in the best case, they are, you know, not that useful. And in the worst case, they're a dead card or they even prevent you from, like, drawing more cards off of Uxi or Claydol or something like that. Um, the other thing that I want to draw attention to is extra lines of Pokemon. Um, it can be really easy to get carried away, carried away with too many lines, especially Pokemon that are, you know, on your types or do cool stuff. Like, I, I see a lot of decks that are, like, a stage two of a certain type and then, like, a full stage one line of that type as well. And they don't, they don't really, like, do anything better than the other. Like, you know, you're, you're playing, like, a full Blaziken line and you have like a 4-4 four, four Arcanine as well. And like Arcanine's got the same damage cap as your Blaziken, maybe a little bit worse, you know, because it's a stage one. It doesn't have the acceleration ability. Like it's got the same weakness. It really doesn't bring anything to your deck, but it's really easy to put stuff like that in there because, you know, you look at it and you're like, oh, you know, I have the energy for this. These cards are cool. But when you look at it, you think about how your games are actually going to play. Things like that, not so useful. So, you know, really, really think about how you are going to play the game. And uh, I actually fairly recently have ended up in situations where I, I have these really cool plays in mind when I build a deck and then I sit down for like a test game or, or even like the first round and I flip over my cards and I'm like, I actually have no idea what basics to get here because like my core strategy <laughs> is so decentralized. Like I have all these cool plays, but my deck like doesn't have any like single core thread that runs through it and makes it a deck so um definitely think about what your deck is doing at all times and uh, and don't let it get away from you yeah you know i think i think you hit a really good point there and i i struggle from the same things too at times where like you you have this really cool play in mind or this like really cool strategy that could happen um and then you 
you get kind of locked up in it because you, you have all these cards and you're like, wow, this is going to be broken. But then, like, your deck can't just be built to do, like, a really obscure play, even if it's going to make you look like a genius, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it's really easy It's really easy to fall into because, uh, I mean, you get, like, attached to the strategy. It's like, wow, no one's done this before. I'm going to do it. It's going to make me look – or I'm going to feel great while I, you know, drop, like, you know, reset stamp into, like, I'm pulling on level X and then – also, I'm going to be, like, Crushing Hammer, Flare Grunt. <laughs> like, yeah, when that happens, that's amazing. But if your deck's... I mean, either you have, like, the nuts build for that, or you might need to build a more general strategy. And you know what? If part of that comes up, I think, I think I'd think i be okay if, if that happened, you know? But you can't just go for, like, you know, the perfect the perfect play. You know, my deck's built to do that one thing. So I, I think you're absolutely right by that. Glad you brought that up. Yeah, yeah, you can't... You know, you can't base your deck around low percentage plays at the end of the day um on the flip side sometimes those low percentage plays or those like one-off plays end up being insanely strong um my my favorite one in general is like celebration wind shaman or delta switch mewtwo uh, mewtwo delta species where you bench them and then you can move your energy around your board however you like um a lot of the times in deck with decks with those cards i'm like oh yeah you know these cards will be good every now and then and i'm sure i can probably use them once a game or so at least to you know smooth out my game plan a little bit but then i end up playing the decks and it's like oh my gosh like the more times i can use these the better like these cards are crazy so um you you definitely (laughs) want to um you know uh, think about the the deck in practice i would say um you know Think about your general turn, not your super high odds or super low odds. Like I'm going to reset stamp and then Emperor's Command and then Flare Grunt and Crushing Hammer and they're going to be totally out of stuff and they have nothing to do. Uh, Think about instead like, you know, you're going to like play Judge and then use Empoleon's ability. Like that's that's pretty easy to do. And that's really good. Like that is such a powerful thing that you can do. So littler things like that and that are that are a lot easier to pull off are often going to be a lot better than the super low odds plays that require multiple cards and you know maybe they have a much stronger outcome but are you really going to be able to pull that off like are your games going to play out that way most of the time the answer is no so think about what you're going to be using in general and and practicality is always key yeah and i mean i don't have an exact uh you know statistics equated for this but like i mean the more cards that are required for a play to happen the less likely it's going to happen like i think everybody <laughs> gets that so no uh, doubt I mean, and that's something you got to consider like empoleon level x judge two cards cool i can make that happen empoleon judge um well, like flare grunt crushing hammer uh like that gets a lot harder <laughs> at a certain point yeah um, exactly and i mean at some point you know you gotta start hitting stuff off of certain supporters and draws and it's just like no like <laughs> dial it back a little bit because it can it can be really easy to get lost in that you know cube is ultimately about doing really cool things and having a good time and uh sometimes you've got some cool things that you think about and that you get really attached to but ultimately make your deck worse in the end so i think something too that kind of comes up too is like okay i drafted 30 trainer cards but am i gonna throw all 30 trainer cards in my deck is there such a thing as too many trainers you know yeah and and we talked about this just a little bit earlier but there is uh most of the time if you have 15 plus supporters in your deck there are probably some supporters in there that are not that great uh or mm-hmm if they're all amazing then like why do you need 15 of them you know (laughs) like if you're if your quality is insane then you don't need such a high count because you're gonna get by just fine on on a fewer number and then you can devote more spaces to other stuff so uh definitely there is such a thing as too many trainers uh you know really look at what you're gonna need you know you don't need to be able to play professor sycamore 15 times in a game you just don't it's it's you deck not out at a certain point <laughs> yeah it's just not a need for any deck um uh, so and and this mileage is going to vary a lot on this because if you have lower supporter quality then you're going to need more supporters because they're not going to draw into each other as often um, like say your average supporter is like a rocket's grunt where you discard one draw three well probably need to hit another supporter in the next four cards because for your draw for turn so having a higher number at that point that's going to be a good idea but you know if your average supporter is like a sycamore or a pont or something 
very powerful, then it's not as important to have such a huge number. And uh, and that number changes too, depending on what kind of support options you've got, you know? Um, things like having a Uxie Legends Awakened, a Shaman EX, uh, Claydol, Porygon 2 with Download, Porygon 2 with Backup, um, Delcaddy, all of these things are going to affect your supporter count, you know? If you have these really powerful draw support Pokemon, then your uh, your search needs go way up, and and then you can cut down on your you know inferior draw cards a little bit because you've got ways to draw cards with your search. Um, and then on the flip side, if you have something like Download Porygon, which allows you to play two supporters every turn, then you're going to need to make your count go up because you want to actually be able to take advantage of that. You want to be playing those two supporters every turn to get that advantage. So. Uh, it, it really does vary, and there is definitely such a thing as too many. Yeah, I think, I think um, especially as you were explaining that, it just kind of comes back to what is your deck trying to do. I think that's just kind of like the epicenter of uh, deck building is strategy, right? And that's, that's probably pretty self-explanatory uh, for most card games. But in cube especially, I mean, if you don't, if you don't have any context of what the cards make sense in your deck, you're, I mean, you're going to be kind of lost, so... Always kind of go back to well, what's what's my strategy, and then um, do I really need like all of these cards that do the same thing to execute that strategy? That's kind of something too, um, especially if you're playing maybe in like a six man queue, because in eight, if you have like a bunch of like cards, uh, really good cards, you're doing well. But like in six, uh, especially in a big queue, you end up with a pretty large card pool. And um, I mean, this is a power off example, but like if you have like thirty ultra balls, for example, which you'll never have unless something crazy happened, but um, you wouldn't put 30 Ultra Balls in your deck because there's diminishing returns, right? And the reason I say that is because at a certain point, um, if you have too many cards doing the same thing, um, regardless of what that thing is, it's, it's eventually going to lose. It's going to be a losing situation. Um, and that's not saying you shouldn't have high counts of like good search and good draw, but like if your deck is just all draw, but it does nothing else besides drawing cards, you're going to lose. So you have to consider like, okay, do I have enough of X like effect that I'm looking for? Um, and if not, uh, what can I cut? And if I do, well, what else do I need to put in here? So I don't know. I always kind of like looking at it, like uh, making sure you're balancing the amount of, I say balancing the amount of effects you need. Like obviously like search and draw are great, but like um, when you get in situations where, you know, maybe I have like too many supporters, um, you can start looking at it like, okay, how many draw effects do I have versus how many search effects do I have? You know what I mean? Yeah, very well said. Um, and then, of course, um, I mean, we probably have already touched on this a bunch already, but you need recovery. <laughs> um, I, generally, if you don't have recovery in your deck, you need to, you should be uh, finding spots in there for your deck for that to fit in there because all all else fails, like you're gonna need to get cards back. Um, so if unless you're able to like you know cycle the same attacker. Um, uh, if you don't have recovery and you're still at like 60 cards, that's going to be probably the ones you need to fit in there. Oh yeah, for sure. And and I would say really everything in your deck is related to recovery. Every every count that you have is in some way related to recovery. Uh, the number of energy you can play, the number of Pokemon you need to play, uh, the number of other trainers you can get away with. Uh, everything ultimately is tied to how many times you can do it again and especially with pokemon and energy those things are really really critical to keep in mind well that's, like, that's what's interesting about pokemon as you know a card game and like the discard pile can be sometimes a more consistent you know deck to search from because it's in there you can grab it right away i mean you've seen that with battle compressor I mean like expanded um having access to things in your discard pile is a lot more consistent than having to draw for them yeah, we've uh, actually. I, I definitely have. Oh, sorry. Oh, uh, go on. You're good. We we've had formats in Pokemon's history, not just Battle Compressor. Uh, when four of Junk Arm was in every deck, or three or four of Junk Arm was in every deck, people would actually play a trainer that basically didn't do them any good um, to have it in their discard, and uh, and I think that that's something that you can definitely apply to Cube as well. I mean, you're never going to have four Junk Arm in a cube deck, or realistically, you're not going to. But, uh, you know, sometimes your discard can be a toolkit, and your ability to access that toolkit is going to determine at least the outcome of some of your games. Yeah, so that's definitely something you want to keep in mind, too. Like, if you're playing cards like VS Seeker or Dowsing Machine, 
um, then then you have a lot of more options, and you can start building your deck around. Okay, I can actually reuse certain supporters, or if let's just say we're talking about crazy combos, I'm trying to go and pull on Judge. Well, it's a lot easier to find my Judge if I know I have like access to like three uh, supporter retrieval cards. Um, so you can think about it like that too. Again, tying all the way back to what is my deck trying to do? But, you know, considering that, you know, recovery is going to play a huge role in how your games go. So you want to make sure that you're factoring in, okay, my attacker gets knocked out. How am I getting that back? Or how am I going to make sure I don't run out of energy? And I think actually like one of the most underlooked parts about cube that happens a lot more than you think is how do I, how am I going to avoid not decking out? Because deck out happens a lot actually, or rather it can happen a lot because, you know, you get through your deck pretty efficiently you know through all of these turns and then you end up with like three cards left in deck well unless the game unless you have you know a way to shore up the game in a few turns you're gonna deck out so you got to think about how am i even gonna keep cards still in my deck you know oh my gosh deck out is so common in cube <laughs> I, I see so many cube games and because of deck out it's it's crazy so uh definitely keep that in mind and uh this is kind of moving into the next uh next topic a little bit but yeah. uh Keep an eye on your deck. Keep an eye on your options as far as recovery because uh, it's it's a lot of the time going to matter. And if you're used to playing standard right now where decking out is basically never a thing, um, it, it's going to be a shock. Yeah, so just be ready. And you know what? Yeah, let's go into the next part of this. Let's talk about just playing, uh, which, I mean, I'm assuming most people listening to this know how to play Pokemon, but playing cubes a lot different. Uh, you're dealing with a lot more pieces uh every deck kind of has a lot of unique cards um filled with them so instead of playing like four of all your best trainers you're playing like one of of like 15 different cards so pokemon too i think that's another thing too it's making sure you're understanding just all of the different stuff that's going on um so the number one thing i i think that comes up here is when you're sitting down and playing against an opponent you need to understand what their deck is trying to do um hopefully by this point you know what your deck is trying to do because that's what you built your deck on but uh the next part of that is understanding, okay, what are they going for? So they flip over a horsey, um, understanding what is that going to evolve into? What am I needing to be on the lookout for? And this kind of helps when you understand, like, um, what lines are in the cube. So maybe if this is just going in blind, you might not be at a huge advantage. Granted, if you play cube before, you generally can figure out what certain archetypes do. But uh, knowing what the lines are supposed to do, so if I know what the Kingdra line does in this X cube and... They, you know, have Legends Awaken Kingdra that does, like, a bunch of snipe damage, and maybe they have the Prime in there, too. I'm going to be thinking about that. Um, it's harder to play perfectly in a, ma in a round when you don't know what your opponent's deck does, right? Exactly, yeah. I mean, knowledge is extremely important, and people who play a lot of Standard or have played a lot of Standard in the past, a lot of the time they take knowledge for granted. Once you're in cube, I mean, you're in the Wild West, especially in a singleton or mostly singleton cube, which many cubes are. Uh, the the variety of options you're going to need to play around are going to increase pretty dramatically. So uh, whether it be prior knowledge going in, whether it be, you know, just having a general feel like, you know, I know that the Kingdras in the game's history, like generally attack for a few energy, like that can be huge. That can be so big and so good to know. Uh, because it can allow you to play around certain bad situations. For example, if I am in a cube where the power level is appropriate for Kingdra Legends Awaken and my opponent flips over a horsey, I'm not going to put a bunch of energy on like some valuable Pokemon in the active spot because there's a solid chance they were a candy in the Kingdra and hit me for 60 on turn two. <laughs> I'm going to be really sad mm -hmm. if that 60 damage goes on to the Pokemon that I need the next turn. So things like that um and it's it's not something that happens immediately and it is something that you can like kind of train i guess like if you just read cards that's pretty boring so uh just just kind of keep that in mind like you know t test your knowledge for the history of pokemon and the card pool that exists and uh and maybe play a little bit safer than you normally would in standard it's really easy to play you know 10 damage outside of your opponent's range because there are not that many cards that people play but play 10 damage outside of your range in cube your opponent drops a plus power it's like yeah okay now now things are really bad so um play a little bit safe i think is a general generally good rule and something i was going to suggest too since you brought it up is if you ever wanted to look at cubes i mean self plug i guess the cube discord is a great place to look um you could go in and see any of the any of the cube leagues 
cubes we've used and they all have images of all the cards so if you ever wanted to see what pokemon make up different lines like that's a great way to find that out i also find just cubing in general i know that's kind of lame advice but like having cubed for several years and played different cubes i mean i have a pretty good idea what a lot of lines do just because i've been exposed to them i've drafted them played them played against them and i think a lot of players are in that situation where okay i played against a deck with Aritos in it like a ton of times I'm well aware that they are going to inflict status conditions on me so when I see someone's little or spinner egg I I know what's going to happen so um unless there's maybe an Aritos that got printed that I'm not aware of um generally you have an idea of what to expect so um definitely I think it just kind of plays on the experience part and like I said you also can look at cards too I honestly as a cube builder I do that anyway I'm sure Connor does as well when you're looking at trying to find lines for a cube or you're looking at maybe potential lines to switch in and out you end up looking at most of the card pool in pokemon so you kind of get a feel for what different types do but not everyone's a cube builder and that's totally fine but i think if you're interested in trying to learn more about um, strategies i would definitely look at the cube uh, discord for uh, guidance there yeah it's a good way to just look over cubes and kind of see what's out there um there's there's increasingly more youtube content out, th out there for cubes both uh stuff that i've made stuff that uh joe bernard has posted some stuff uh, omni folk um there there are a couple of channels that have cube content that can be a good way to just kind of get a feel for what might be out there but you know whenever you're in a situation you see your opponent flip over a familiar pokemon see your opponent flip over say a torchic Think about the Blaziken lines you've seen in the past and think about how the power level that you're playing, you know, might match up to those Blazikens and you can get a pretty good idea for what your opponent might have in store. And I think, too, um, when you're in the draft also, I mean, it's not a bad idea just to read the Pokemon that comes through you. I mean, like, you see, like, a stage two that looks interesting. And, again, there's no problem with reading cards in the draft. I don't know why anyone would have any problem with that. Um you should obviously you don't know a certain line or a certain Pokemon style. It's okay to read those during the draft and get a feel for what those types of decks do. You might not rem remember what every line does, but you know, you might see something interesting and that might stick. Um, so definitely don't be afraid to like take some, you know, proactiveness and read during the draft. Absolutely. Uh, that, now, lines aside, um, I think this also kind of plays into this next point of understanding, like, dex limitations. Uh, and Connor kind of touched on that, too, where, like, in standard, you're kind of playing around the fact that most decks don't hit you for exactly what they need. Um, so maybe I'm Zacian, I hit for 260, um, and I may a like, tag team decks be like, all right, you can't one-shot me. So, But most of the ADP decks are built the same way. In cube, it's a lot different because everyone is exposed to a completely different set of cards and you don't really have any clue maybe if assuming there's no open deck list of what is and what isn't in their deck so they might hit you for just 10 out of range but also again like kind of say drop a plus power or a zigzagoon and you kind of got to be uh, prepared for that um especially I, i'll like kingdra as an example because uh you could do 60 to somebody but then there's also the prime that just puts an extra damage counter out there and i would imagine if you're not ready for something like that to happen could totally um, offset your game plan. So, but it works the other way around too. Um, I think sometimes, especially if you are unfamiliar with the deck, you might give it too much credit for what it can and can't do. Um, if you're looking at a deck and it looks like it might be a slower deck, uh, might need you know, quite a few energies to attach. That is good to know because you now know how many turns you have until you can expect a huge uh, threat to come on the board. And do I need to be ready to deal with like a lot of HP? Um, so damage is a definitely a huge uh, proponent of that. Um, Connor, do you have anything about that in, in particular? Yeah, for sure. I would say the biggest one in, in general, because it's hard to play around like Kukui. It's hard to play around plus power. It is doable, but in some cases, if you don't know what's in your opponent's deck, it, it might not seem like the right play, um, or it might not be feasible at all. Uh, the big one for me is energy acceleration and the number of energy a deck can get into play in a turn. Because... Mm -hmm. If your opponent cannot get enough energy into play in a turn to either attack at all or use some particularly threatening attack that might knock you out or something, you can get more mileage out of your attackers. You know, it's going to result in wins a lot more often if, you know, let's say you have a 40 damage Electivire level X in the active and your opponent has one energy in play um, and all their attackers need to attack for three. 
if you panic, then you might say, oh, you know, I, I don't know what's in their deck. They could knock me out. I'm going to retreat. But if you've seen a, a solid chunk of their deck, which you might have at that point, then you could say, you know, I'm going to leave the Selectifier in the active. Maybe they have to use a weaker attack. Say it hits you for 60, so you have 100 damage. You retreating out of that Electivire at 40 damage and you retreating out of that Electivire at 100 damage, you got a whole extra turn out of those energy and out of that Pokemon that you might not ever have to put in the active again. So things like that, you know, taking advantage of those opportunities when you see them can be tremendous. So energy, I would say, is my number one thing that uh, that you want to keep an eye on. Does it look like your opponent has ways to accelerate them? And uh, if you have an open deck list, then really just, you know, look at their deck. Do they have ways to accelerate? Play around the knowledge that you have as far as their deck's ability to get energy and play faster than normal. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, too. And that, that also, maybe a lot of us could also be scarred from the fact that, you know, Zacian can just, uh, you can just drop a, a, a plain Zacian and then metal patch twice to it and attach and attack. Uh, for big damage on like you know one turn but in cube it's a little bit different i mean sometimes those plays do happen but like more generally if your opponent doesn't have that much set up after you take a knockout they are going to have a lot harder time uh responding that same turn so energy is, is, is especially if i said the energy acceleration i think a lot of this comes up too if they have access to maybe like Walder or dce dce i think plays a lot of uh or double colorless um to say its full name is like more of a can be a, can be a big deal. I remember watching. <laughs> not to bring up bad memories for you, Connor, but I remember watching that year your round against Omnipoke uh, in the Champions Cube, and um, him just having access to all of the energy acceleration, like DCE, Mina, um, Bronzong, uh, G. It's just like, wow, the energy acceleration is just so rampant, and it allowed him to get off like packs back to back to back. And honestly, not knowing what that deck did as a you know as an observer was like. And he attacked you for 80, like, on turn two? Like, that's a big deal, right? Like, how do you even, uh, like, approach a matchup like that, right? <laughs> yeah, knowing stuff like that is just so huge. And at the same time, I mean, you know, in, in the similar vein to what we're talking about, um, keep in mind if your opponent, you know, has ways to get energy in play. And that's beyond, you know, like, oh, they have Psy Shadow Gardevoir in play and it can attach a Psychic to the active from the deck. You know, that that's pretty obvious, like, that that is on the table <laughs> but if uh yeah. you know if you might get totally wrecked by like a welder play or a blacksmith play and your opponent's playing fire and you're able to play around it because you're not always able to but um in the cases where you are in the cases where you're like oh you know i could put this pokemon with more hp active if you do a little bit less damage but be in a safer spot you know sometimes that can win the, or lose the game for you deciding how safe you are with your opponent's energy when you know they might have some extra reach they might have welder they might have patchy risu from call of legends and shaman unleashed uh they might have you know any number of cards in pokemon's history that's allowed them to get an extra energy in play and in some decks it's going to be a lot more likely than others so um so you've got to be conscious of that and you've got to be wary yeah, another thing too I want to kind of bring up too that we talked about a lot about when like, we talk about I guess each part of this uh, segment is you know do they have access to recovery because um, you might see the Walder come down once but do they have a way to get it back? Do you think they're running via Seeker or Galaxy Machine uh, to find that card because that that also could play a significant part, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I would say in decks where the supporter quality is super powerful, um, a lot of the time they are going to have prioritized that supporter recovery a lot higher. So uh, just just keep that in mind. You know, it's hard to play uh, hard to play around stuff that you don't know exists. And a lot of the time you don't need to play around stuff like that. But, uh, you know, in, in the cases where you are able to do that and they will happen, um, Keep in mind, you know, what are the impacts of recovering that welder? Or what are the impacts of the opponent having Amina? What are the, you know, things like that. Like, if you have the flexibility to play around cards like that, you can not get caught out by things that might end your game otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. And that kind of is the last thing on, like, in this part is, like, speed. Like, how quickly do you expect them to attack, right? We talked about, like, Kindra being able to hit you for 60, maybe on turn two of the rare candy. Um, 
like how do you even like i guess that a lot of that comes from like you know knowledge archetypes when you say yeah and and unfortunately some parts of cube knowledge are hard to convey just by teaching a lot of uh, especially as far as like knowledge of what cards do what lines do that comes from having played when those cards were around or it comes from having played a lot of cube and so you know uh, I, I knew andrew's already said it and i'm gonna say it again just play cubes if you want to get better at cube if you want to improve your knowledge that is one thing that you can do without really even trying uh you know some some aspects of your play you will have to think about and you will have to actively improve but just learning cards you can play cube and not really think about winning at all and and you can learn lots about cards just kind of passively so uh that's something to keep in mind you know you had a cube that didn't go well but you're new to the format maybe you probably learned a lot without really even realizing it so um but but going back to speed kind of getting back on topic um speed can be really big you know knowing the capabilities of your opponent knowing the capabilities of their lines you know if my opponent starts fan p then i am probably going to be pretty leery about putting some valuable pokemon in the active spot until i'm attacking with it because i could get hit for 60 damage with a don fan prime or even 40 damage with some of the rapid spin don fans uh, on the flip side, you know, if my opponent starts Mareep, well, Ampharos is not exactly a fast attacking Pokemon, so I can probably pretty safely attach to the active and, and feel okay about it. So things like that, you know, if they they determine games like so early on, if you put two energy on your active Pokemon and your opponent evolves and hits you for a lot of damage, more than you were expecting, then your your game can be over you could be back a couple of attachments maybe even like a stage one that you've evolved into like that is huge and on the flip side you know if you're stranded behind some other pokemon that you put active and your opponent's just sitting there evolving up into ampharos and dusk noir and all these pokemon that you know you probably could have gone pretty aggressive with you're going to give your opponent a lot more time or even even just one turn that you might not have actually needed to give them and you would have been totally safe and definitely in the right to go aggressive there so speed is another thing to think about and unfortunately a lot of playing in accordance with your opponent's speed does come down to card knowledge so that's that's the one downside here yeah so i think i kind of if i was to summarize these uh, you know, basically what we're trying to say is having knowledge beforehand, at least knowledge of cube or knowledge about the cube you're about to play is probably one of your best bets of, um, you know, making the right plays. So, uh, assuming everybody, you know, knows how to play Pokemon, you know how to sequence and all that other stuff, granted, there's always more to learn. Um, when you're thinking about uh, how to, you know, separate yourself from, you know, an average cube uh, player to a, a better cube player, uh, you definitely want to think about what, their lines are doing so that's gonna, like, gonna come from experience and then i think the next thing is um and this might be the last thing we talk about is price checking <laughs> um i think that's one of the most underlooked skills in cube but it can be the most punishing um connor you want to talk you want to talk about that yeah i mean price checking is definitely something that is useful in competitive pokemon but in cube it is so critically important in so many decks you know, just uh, knowing which of your, at, at the, you know, baseline, which of your core pieces are prized. You know, you don't want to be digging in your deck for the Pokemon that you need for a specific situation only to find out that it's not there. Because you could have played that game completely differently if you had known that it wasn't there. So, really keep in mind what prizes you're going to have. Um, and it's not always just going to be your Pokemon to you know, you you might have some trainers that are really important. Uh, an example that I can think of recently is um, in, in a cube deck, in my cube league deck right now. I'm playing uh, five hole and transceiver, which is a very powerful card. Let's you search your deck for a hole and supporter or your discard. Uh, but knowing what hole and supporters are in my deck is so important because I only have one of each. So if I play a transceiver in the mid game and I need a scientist and there's no scientist, well, you know, maybe my adventure is in my discard, so I just failed that transceiver. And I actually did play a game uh, round three. I, I misplayed badly where I transceivered and I hadn't checked for my hole in supporters. And it, the one that I needed was not in there. And the other one I had already used and it was in my discard and I failed it and I had no other supporters. So 
things like that can be huge. So anything that you can search, anything that you would reasonably need in a game, you know, your big playmaking cards, your line toppers that define your deck, all of these can be really important prizes to check depending on what you're trying to do. Uh, on the flip side, if you have like a really samey deck that's really homogenated, you have lots of attackers that doesn't really matter what they do or they do pretty similar things, then prizing is not going to be as big of an impact on you. And that can impact the way that you build your deck and you draft too. If you have a lot of really important singleton cards, then prize interaction like Gladian, like Azelf Legends Awakened, Rotom from Heart Gold Soul Silver, all of those can be really important cards if you have super important singleton cards. However, if your deck is, you know, if you have lots of good options and, and your attackers are all pretty similar, then it's not nearly as important. You know, you could maybe take that Professor Oak's New Theory instead of the Azelf because the Azelf is not going to give you that much of an advantage, whereas the Professor Oak's New Theory is a great card in every deck. So uh, in general, I would say prize recovery is extremely valuable in any cube deck, but there are those that don't really need it. So uh, something to keep in mind either way, and prize checking at the end of the day is a so, so valuable skill in cube. I was going to say, um, price checking has been especially important in my cube league deck because uh, I only have one Legends of like King Drake, there's only one in the cube. And uh, I have a 1 1 clade all line, and I play a few important techs like Umbreon EX, which is like Rock, and then Espeon EX, which devolves the bench, as well as Kirsto. And all of those cards have been prized at one point, not all together, but like individually have been prized at certain points in my games. And it's good information to know. I've had one play in particular where um, I was going to play Guzma Hala for my uh, Curse Stone for game, and I ended up prizing it, and I didn't check for it, and uh, I can't remember what the outcome was, but it, was, it didn't feel very good to discard two cards and then fail. So, um, price checking comes up literally all the time for every player, so um, just something to keep in mind, and also I think it also rewards play if you can think ahead to um, maybe if I thought ahead, like, okay, I need Curse Stone to close out this game. Do I have Curse Stone in deck? And maybe this is like a few turns before I actually would need it. I would I would want to check. Uh, and that's that's crucially important, especially if I, I don't have access to Aze Elf in my deck. So uh, if I prize something, it is just stuck there uh, until I take a prize. But it sucks when it's your last prize because then you're just never going to grab it. Um, so that can obviously change a lot of how you play. I think something too that uh, comes up is did you prize your recovery cards? Because as we talked about, recovery is something that might be what lets you win the game or stuck with one prize left. And if your last prize is Super Rod, for instance, that's a huge deal because if you aren't aware of that until you need it, it might be too late. Um, I've gotten situations like that before where I have set up the game to where like I just need to attack one more time and then I don't think about my last prize being Super Rod, but then unfortunately it is there or Rescue Stretcher or what have you. And I'm just kind of stuck like a sitting duck. And <laughs> it, it feels bad, but you want to make sure you're aware of you know all of those cards that you might need you don't have to know them right away. Like my first deck search, I'm not necessarily thinking about every card in my deck. Um, but I, as I go through the game, I'm I'm looking for those cards that I think are going to be important. And I think I don't know. How do you approach that, Connor? Do you look for every card in the beginning, or do you um, or do you kind of just play it by okay? I know I'm going to need this later. Let me see if I have it now. Gosh, I think it would be totally overwhelming to try and figure out everything at the beginning. Um, no, no, no. So the, the first thing that I do is I find my big pieces. So like my, you know, important Pokemon. And then in my case, this time, the, the Holon supporters, I'm pretty much going to need those from the start of the game. So knowing exactly what uh, is in my deck as far as those are, that's huge. But then uh, things like recovery, things like, you know, your supporter counts, uh, things like utility cards, they are not things that you need to know in the first two turns, but continue checking your prizes midway through the game. If you, as you have a better idea of how the game is going to play out and evolve, continue, you know, checking up on prizes as the cards become more relevant. So if you're going to go for this strategy where you go really deep in your deck, but you need to have your super rod that you know, you know, you know, you drafted and you put in when you were building your deck, check when you when you're searching, you know, midway through the game or toward the later game, make sure that's in there because it's going to change your play so drastically. You are going to feel terrible if you play a juniper and you draw your last seven cards and your super rod is in your prizes. <laughs> like you, you just lost the game right there. Mm -hmm. So things like that, you know, 
in in standard prize checking throughout the game is not as common i would say as in cube but prize checking is not as critical as in cube in general because you have much higher counts but uh, you know be be aware and be conscious and be checking for the things that you're going to need over the next two to three turns as you continue to search your deck throughout the game yeah well said um so kind of in summary with all this when it comes to just playing in cube it, it takes a lot of practice i think is it's fair um definitely some easy ways where you can level up is well one understanding uh other deck strategies so if you have some time maybe check out the cube discord links are of course in the description um check out some of the cubes that maybe we're talking about maybe check out some of the the vods on our twitch channel twitch.tv slash p3 podcast uh self plug um where you can find vods of the champions cube uh and watch you know as you know try to get a feel for what these lines do but then on top of that you know price checking is going to be a huge proponent of optimal play so make sure you're just trying to you know there's a lot of Im- there's a lot of imperfect knowledge in pokemon you want to make sure you just hedge that as much as you can uh, Connor, do you have any last thoughts on this segment, maybe about building, playing, or what have you before we close it out? Play lots of energy, draft recovery like your life depends on it, and uh, that's that's my soapbox. Yeah, I think, I think well said. Um, I echo the same thoughts. So that's going to wrap up this segment. Um, we're approaching the, uh, the hour mark on this segment, so we definitely talked for a while. Um, so stick around. We're going to come back to our conclusion segment, and we'll be right back. All right, welcome back. So we actually have a very special segment. Uh, we haven't really had a guest on before, but if you've been paying attention, you'll know that Cube, uh, Champions Cube just ended. So we are joined by the winner of Champions Cube, Mike Gibbs. Mike, how are you doing? I'm doing good. So yeah, you are our first guest on the podcast. So <laughs> welcome. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. I'm glad to be on. Glad to have you. And obviously, Connor is here as well. How are you, Connor? I'm doing well. Yeah, still here. Um, I don't know how much I'll say in this upcoming session uh, segment, but uh, definitely still here. Yeah, we definitely want to put a spotlight on uh, Mike's run. So it's interesting. Mike actually drafted the same deck as Connor, the uh, Honchkrow Lucario deck. Did you guys talk about that beforehand, or is that planned at all? Like, obviously, you can't plan what cards you're going to get in a draft, but uh, some very similar lists there. Yeah, we we talked about it pretty in depth. I would say. Like, yeah. Yeah, obviously we're not in the same pod, so we could just say whatever we want to each other, and it wouldn't really affect our actual draft. And yeah, we drafted the same deck. It, I didn't think we'd draft the same deck, but we just drafted the same thing. So we saw actually uh, when we when we filmed the draft, uh, we we watched Connor's uh, view of it, and his was very interesting, especially like the way in which cards wheeled to him. Did you have like? Uh, how like how did you have any trouble getting any of the pieces for your deck, Mike, or how was your draft in general? Um, so I got like every card I could have possibly ever wanted. I wanted a lot of like recovery for like, um, if I I really wanted Cessation Crystal, I really want a Pokemon Center League, and a lot of ways to get those back. And I got exactly that, and I got every Honch Crow I wanted. I didn't really want the the one Honch Crow. I have, I'm running a four three two line of Honch Crow level X and um, I didn't really want the one punch crow that does more damage if you spread because I just want to one shot things, so I was fine not getting that, and yeah, I got basically everything I wanted. I got the, in my opinion, the best of cards I could have wanted, and yeah. yeah. I was gonna say you're uh looking at your deck, it, it was very you had so many great cards. You had uh, item finder, computer search, cessation crystal, um. Which are all just amazing cards to find, and then I, I guess uh, was your line pretty uncontested? Uncontested, like no one was really going for uh, dark fighting in your pod. Yeah, so I think about towards the end of the draft, someone took a the Honchkrow, which ended up being Odysseus. Um, I let it wheel for like something like a good card. I don't remember what it was, and I and I got taken. And I was kind of weird. I thought it was so weird because it was like pack five, and everything's been wheeling to me that's been dark. But I was fine not getting it, like I said before. And, yeah, I got basically every Pokemon I wanted. But, yeah, 
I mean, that's pretty well seen. Sounds pretty great. So then, uh, you guys said you talked about this beforehand. What about like the archetype interests you? Was it because of like the changes that you get the four darkness energy up front, or like was there anything else that stood out? It was the changes to dark. I would say like first and foremost were the things that made us or turned us onto it. Um, so the special darkness energies with the Weavile were a combo that was around in standard that were uh, was powerful uh, in like 2010 at certain points, and um, then we also saw the Dark Claws coming in, of course. Um, basically, the stuff that made up for Dark Ride Level X leaving the queue made Weavile specifically a lot better. So I think that was the big thing that motivated us. And also, like, it was new and shiny, and I think there was an element of that that, like, made it more appealing, um, even maybe subconsciously, because... There were a lot of decks in the cube that were very, very good. I think we talked about basically like every major line in the cube and talked about a whole bunch of different decks, but ultimately this was the one that we, I would say, were highest on. Would you, would you say that, Mike? Yeah, I think this is like, you know, you tell me Lucario's in, I'm probably down. So, and, uh, <laughs> and yeah, I thought that Honcho was a very good partner for Lucario because they cover for each other very well. And yeah, it's, it has like, the darkness wing that can recycle stuff, which it like was just like that's something I really wanted to play because if I can like abuse very good cards, I think I can win a lot of games, and that appealed to me very much. Were there any yeah. cards like in your? Because um, I mean, you, yeah, you, I imagine your draft pool had a lot of just like insane cards from like what you actually played. Was there any cards that you uh cut in your uh before the final build that you wish you would have had, or any cards I guess in your deck that you would have changed, or do you feel like you had like the perfect list for the event? Uh, look at my draft pool right now i don't think there's actually very much i could have wanted um i had options like uh the stadium uh recycler porygon 2 um i think yeah and i just chose to cut that because but like i it could have been nice to have against like omnipoke's deck but i don't think i like i obviously didn't need it but it could have been nice to have and i had like a hard cut was like eco arm and field blower, but I felt like those cards just like didn't help what I was going for too much, and I just ended up cutting them. But I don't really regret something too much. I mean, you, um, did, win, you did win the event, so I guess yeah. <laughs> it's, it's hard to like, like when you, when you win in an event, it's you don't really uh, look back and regret too much because like obviously you did win. So yeah, but I I think I I usually not too good at like just nailing it off this like first build but i feel like i did that with this deck with the cards i drafted yeah i mean like i definitely like thought you had like all the right pieces uh so sacred crystal was huge we saw that in the finals uh did that come up a lot in your other games uh being able to turn off poker power and the poker bodies against your opponents yeah there was a a few games where i would just have sensation crystal and then if they ever knocked out the honcho in the active i would just go junk arm for sensation crystal and i basically just became a Zalvador deck where i felt like it uh, and I just I thought that was super strong against like deck if I, if I really wanted it. Yeah, I mean like that that, that kind of like uh, power, especially when you're comboing it with like being able to grab a card from your uh, discard with the Honchkrow's attack. Like it seems like really solid. Um, I guess we should go like let's talk about your run then. So for you, you obviously didn't lose any sets. Um, where did you play against round one? So, um, if you want to go technical, I had to buy round one, but half the the league did. <laughs> and then going into winners round two, um, I would played against uh, who was it? JL with Kingdra. Ah, uh, okay. So one of the stage two decks. We didn't see too many of those in the second week, but um, Kingdra deck. I mean, that seems like um, pretty close to maybe favorable even for you since you're um uh, able to match their speed and also have access to uh stuff like Sands and then Cessation Crystal or Turn Off Kingdra Prime. Like th that matchup. Ever do you have anything interesting in that matchup, or is that like pretty straightforward? I felt like the Kingdra's matchup was always uh, closer than you'd think, because if I didn't one-shot it, it would just, like, retreat and heal, which ended up being a big deal. And I felt like I um, didn't play the matchup perfectly, but I played it well, done, well enough where, like, my deck was able to pull it out. I don't think any games were, like, ridiculously close against Jail, where I felt like I was going to lose, like, late in the game. But they're all, like, both the games were pretty decent. And, uh... Yeah, um, I think just like his draft just w wasn't uh 
quite to mind. He didn't have like the amount of options I had, but yeah, he both the games he like did he like drew pretty well, so they were both really good games, I think. Nice. Um so then you went you won that round, which is good. And then onto the next round, what did you hit? I hit the other Kingdra player, I think. <laughs> oh, back to back think, Kingdras? <laughs> uh Mysterious Player. Yeah. Oh, nice. So his deck has uh all the Porygon twos. Um, I only saw a backup and download the whole time. Um, well, I guess he has a three three line, but it's all the good Porygons. And uh, yeah, his uh, Kingdra line was very good at like, not me. I'm gonna just retreat and just heal that thing and then attack with a different Kingdra. And he has a lot of options in this deck. Um, game one, I actually had my worst misplay, and I just said, and I just said Darkness Wing. When I didn't realize that Riot got the knockout on my Hostro, because I <laughs> I actually didn't read Riot, so like the first day of playing, I didn't even know what Riot did. Like I didn't, didn't even play it correctly. See, folks, that's why you gotta read your cards. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I didn't get I didn't get punished for it here because uh, um, actually, like his power went out <laughs> and like he just timed out of the game. But I feel like the game could have went any like either way. And if I just remember to say Riot, it wouldn't have been that close anymore i don't think so you hit two but, kingdra decks back to back um did you feel like very similar or was it like the builds like a lot different um both games felt similar playing against them um i feel like mysterious players uh deck was a little bit like quicker and expert belt makes like kingdra so much better because it's a 150 hp pokemon semi active hitting you for 80 for one energy and then when you hit it it just goes away and then just like now deal with this Kingdra while I'm healing the one he just dealt with. And then, like, I have to keep up tempo pretty hard against him. Just make, like, the biggest thing was extra bill and PCL and rough seas. Which, uh, JL did not have an extra bill, I don't think. And, yeah, it, that's why it was a little bit harder. It was, like, mainly just an extra bill thing. So I guess, like, so after playing the first Kingdra, do you already kind of have a game plan then in mind that you wanted to go for when you hit a Mysterious Player? Yeah, usually, like, um... Since deck lists are public, I usually try to make a game plan beforehand, and like, because my deck can uh, has so many options that like I can pretty much craft whatever game plan I think of, and uh, yeah, against both the game, both the players, I just basically went, all right, if I one shot Kingdra, I probably win the game, and that's what I went for both games, uh, like or all four of the games, and uh, yeah, most of the time I got it, but except for like, uh, an extra bell to Kingdra was like the hardest thing to get through because. They could deal with a Honchkrow pretty good, but if I ever got like the uh, Pokemon Center Lady down, and it could like turn the game. But some games that was prized. So yeah, they're they're actually decently close for like my first two rounds, I think. Got it. So yeah, so by round one, and then back to back Kingdras in the next two rounds. Then in the next round, this is maybe was that winter semis that you were in where you faced Omnipoke? Uh, no, it was the round before that, round four. Oh, okay, round four. Yeah. That's that's where you face Omni Pope. So that's the first. Was it like similar to the finals, or was it at least was it closer in those games, or what happened? Um, I feel like the finals were uh, a little bit closer in these two games. Um, these two games felt like if I set up, his deck couldn't beat mine, and we both just did that. Like it, he knew if I set up, he wasn't gonna win. And my setup was Honchkrow level X in the active three dark energies. And a cessation crystal, which basically makes it so Omnipoke like uh, can't use my Diana, it can't poison me, and all he can do is Dragon Rush for me, me for eighty. And what I would do with Honchkrow is I would just Pokemon Center Lady heal it, and then like he has to deal with it again, and then I would just uh, have another uh, BS Seeker Junk Arm or uh, Item Finder in hand to just Pokemon Center Lady again. Honchkrow is fully healed, and then I knock out this throw in the board, and he just scoops. That's how every game went, basically, that I didn't just, like, dead draw. But in this round, um, I won it too well, and I, like, just... Game one, uh, he actually had a pretty good hand, but he uh, didn't read my Murkrow, and my Murkrow has Gust on it, where I could just pick up his wrong G and just put in the active, and it took him a long time to get out of that, and it gave me enough time to just set up a Honchkrow, go in active, and then just do my thing. That's actually uh that's actually really funny because that's something you wouldn't expect, especially like if you're like new to like a cube and you haven't like read the cards fully. Like that Murkrow could be like gauge of fighting 
Uh, mm -hmm. and it's funny how like even like the evolving basics can play a role in like your game plan. I like that a lot. Yeah, that Murkrow is like I could threaten it a lot. Like a lot of times I would like if I felt like the Pokemon the active, like uh like a lot of times I would start like Porygon attach an energy to it. And then like I wouldn't retreat it. Because like if they bench like a big guy, like there's a clay doll on the bench and I want a few more turns, I can just like I don't know, collect her for the Murkrow and then like attach an energy to it, gust up something, and I can get so many turns out of it. It's a lot of decks don't just have retreating options in hand. So yeah, it, it was like a very good option to have. Yeah, and also in that, in that matchup, the Station Crystal was a huge component because like it shut off, like you said, it shut off uh, like his Mightyana and his Poison, which is a huge part of his strategy, as well as uh, Garchomp, Sea Level X's Poke Power that just heals all the SPs, which is devastating in a lot of other games we saw from Onipo. Um, but obviously with the Station Crystal, the active, he couldn't do any of that. Uh, I guess like you probably figured that out probably pretty quickly, probably before you even started playing, that that was going to be a big part. Yeah, I, I want to like. I I like spent like a good like ten minutes trying to figure out how to beat this deck because obviously it was just like stomping like everybody coming up to me and I was like, all right, I know my deck has options. Like, what's the options I need to get together to get to this? And I figured out that like Sensation Crystal and doing ninety with Darkness Wing knocks out everything but a Guard Shot C Little X. And uh, yeah, if I just do that, I can just basically like have this huge thing in the active that one shots everything and. I can just heal it every turn. He can't do enough damage to me to one shot it, so it's just unbeatable for him. Yeah. Um yeah, I mean like that 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 was basically with the finals. <laughs> it was it seemed mm -hmm. like once you got to Station Crystal online with the Honchkrow, it was unfortunately game. Mm -hmm. Uh but I mean some matchups are just like that. That's just how, you know, how any guard game works. Sometimes you have you just have really bad matchups and it, it is what it is. Yeah, I just was basically abusing like something that his deck couldn't handle and yeah, I I definitely felt like it was definitely the best way to try to win those games. For sure. So you're through round four, and now you're at winter semis. Is that correct? Yeah. Who did you face in uh, winter semis? I don't remember watching where you were at in the tournament at that point. Um, I played against uh, Odysseus, which is a big basic uh, sort of stall deck. Um, and that was uh, that was the winter bracket final. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay, so I am on track. Yeah, so you're facing Odysseus with the, the stall. Uh, with a sweet coon and everything, I remember uh, I heard a comment later. It was like I think it might have been on Audio Book Video. He's he was uh, he was uh, Odysseus was his only hope, <laughs> knocking you down. How 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 did you feel about that matchup? Or um, like what was the games like for you? I felt like this matchup was probably like, uh, like the least losable in the entire tournament because like uh, he does have a lightning type Pokemon which like can be scary for me because my Honchkrows are weak to it, but I do have the Lucario to like revenge kill it. So, like, Luxray was, like, my biggest fear in this matchup, but his strategy of, like, tanking, I can easily just go, like, Expert Belt 3 Energy Knockout, or, like, just something like that, and it's, like, no other deck in the tournament really could just have the option of just killing whatever's inactive if I feel like it. And, uh, yeah, it just, like, he couldn't really deal with it. He couldn't go early pressure against me, so once he had 3 Energy in tech and I had 3 Energy on Hodro, my attacker was just better at, like trading so yeah it was game two he like was up three to six but then once i got a honcho established with a uh, the pokemon center lady like combo in my hand with a uh, all different stuff um i just basically like he couldn't deal with it anymore and uh yeah it's just it's just the way my deck is like it just like if it one shots you then like heals whatever you do then i will win that game yeah, it sounds like your last few matchups were pretty um, favorable for sure. Were there any? Was there anything in the field that you were worried about in general, like when you first started? Uh, I was a like, so when I knew Odysseus and One Pine Paul were playing each other, I was actually kind of scared of playing One Pine Paul because he's is heavy, uh, Electivire, which is scary for Honchkrow because that deck can very reasonably one shot a Honchkrow, and. But fortunately for me, Odysseus ended up uh, beating One Pine Paul, and uh, I think I've had a pretty decent shot of losing against One Pine Paul. Yeah, honest. you thought maybe if the, the Electivirus would have been hard to deal with. Yeah, I think like with my Lucario, I still like had a decent shot of winning, but I feel like that deck had a like probably my worst matchup in the field. I would say. Yeah, that's fair. 
Uh, and then we, uh, when we already talked about the finals. That was, uh, yeah, that's pretty much like the like the previous round you described with Onu Folk. It just seems like you you do your game plan and um and just executed it, and then you know it's not a lot he can do to those dancers. So, uh, but uh, very excited to see you come out on top. Uh, I'm sure you're also very excited to win the second champions cube. Um, how did how did you feel after the event? You feel like you, know, you played really well. I'm sure you felt like pretty satisfied at least with how everything went. Um, I'm just curious to hear what your thoughts were on the experience. Uh, yeah, it was really fun. I think it was like probably like my second biggest accomplishment of all time in Pokemon, and like it's just like a pretty like respected tourney, I would say. Um, we have a lot like, of you had a lot of experienced players in the field. It definitely wasn't an easy yeah. tournament to just play in because everyone had to qualify. Yeah, there was a lot of players in the field. Like if you uh, told any competitive Pokemon player the name, like uh, they would recognize it. So like it was a there's a lot of good players in a tournament, and uh, it's probably the hardest cube tournament of all time, or like the most competitive, like try hard cube tournament of all time. Um, so yeah, I was really happy to win it, and yeah, I was. I didn't think my deck had it because of like, like it had a lot of options, but I feel like my support was really weak. But it ended up like my supporter line like got was enough to do it. <laughs> and, it's, funny like, that, it's funny that you say that because I remember. Um... I was watching Omni Post video on his uh his strategy. He felt the same way about his supporters, but he just had extra like consistency with plate all that kind of just compensated for uh the quality of supporters he had. Yeah. If I got basically every game I had a pretty decent access to collector, as long as collector wasn't prized with draw GX. And as long as I got that, usually my, my game plan was fine. I could just get through the game good enough on supporters. Speaking of gameplay, was there any like plays from the whole event that stuck out to you, or anything that you remember doing that you thought was cool? Uh, there's a couple times where I went item finder, grab junk arm, or reverse like the rolls, like junk arm for item finder, discard two more, and then I could back up with Porygon for six. <laughs> because I just got rid of my entire hand because I could just like get rid of everything if I feel like it. And there's also a lot of times in the tournament where uh. I had to discard a lot of good stuff, like against like in game three of finals against Army Poke, I had to uh, computer search away a twins Kakui. But like with this deck, I have a lot of recovery options where I'm like okay with doing that. So like, yeah, like it. There's a lot of like like sketchy discards that end up not being sketchy in a lot of my games. So uh, if you had to like, do it all over again, would you just do everything the same way, or is there anything you'd do differently for the tournament run, or the, how the draft went, or anything? Um, I mean, assuming, like, the draft went the same way, yeah. I, I don't think I would change, like, anything about this list. Or it's like, although, okay, here's some, like, cards I didn't really use. I, I never used Crobat G. I never, I used Weavile, like, once. Um, Honchkrow G was, like, also not that good. Um, and, uh, actually Dark Claw, like, wasn't as good as you think it would be as, like, a two-up in my deck. I felt like um, I almost would have preferred a basic energy over the second Dark Claws. I felt like it was mm. too much, like, with the extra belt already in the deck. And, uh, yeah, but other than that, like, those cards were, like, often just, like, it wasn't that bad that I had, like, a lot of cards I didn't use in my deck because it was very easy to just, like, say, all right, I'm just going to discard these cards with uh, the effect of Junk Arm, I defined or Computer Search. Yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah, it's always the interesting thing is when you look back and you think of, well, did I really even use this card? Um, to what well, it could have been like a different card. Like it's interesting that Dark Claw. You thought you feel that Dark Claw would be better as an energy. And granted, uh, yeah, energy is important, especially like in a format like this where you're only really given maybe a few attack like a attachment a turn. If you get behind on attachments, it can be pretty bad. So, yeah. um, yeah, Dark Claw doesn't exactly get you closer to attacking. Now that that is said, that you know can also help you you know get knockouts, which I'm sure you used it for. Um, yeah. but that's an interesting take on it for sure. Yeah, I just had like. Usually, like, I didn't power up four attackers in a game, and usually Sensation Crystal is, like, a better card than Dark Claw would be for me against a lot of decks. Because in this cube, it's, there's a lot of, like, abilities that I can just, like, all right, I'm just going to turn that off. And it's hard for my opponent to deal with it. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, obviously uh, everything else made it out on top, so uh, great run for sure. Do you have any advice for, like, players who are trying to do – uh? You know, do well in a cube event. Like, do you have any? You've been playing in the cube Discord for a while. I'm uh, mm -hmm. just curious if you had any general tips for any of our uh, newer players out there. 
Uh, I would say just like if you think something's good, just try it out and see how it does. If it's if it's in a well balanced cube, there's probably like a way for a lot of strategies to work. And if you like, just don't be scared to try stuff. Um, Hot Trail wasn't played that much in the past, and like I thought, well, if I just put a ton of energy together and just see if Darkness Link could just go off, you know, try that out. Um, and yeah, it, like just say, just try out what you think is uh is good or you know you learn it from your mistakes if a deck turns out bad and yeah um and if you draft good cards anything can work yeah nope solid advice so you're already qualified for the next champions cube right yeah okay so we'll be definitely seeing you at the next one in august uh connor do you have any thoughts on uh so you guys have a similar deck do you have any thoughts on, as the cube builder on that archetype do you think anything's going to change in the cube from it i'm curious to hear what your thoughts are so the cube does have a lot of changes on the way. I'm really excited to make some revisions post Champions Cube. I've been talking to uh, the admins about them a lot, but uh, interestingly enough, Mike's deck is not really going to result in any significant changes. Um, dark is going to go down to one Dark Claw, I think, and um, that's about it. I'm I'm debating on whether Pokemon Center Lady should go to the Lost Zone, but I think that. Uh, Mike's deck and Mike's matchups specifically like really lended themselves that working out well. So I don't necessarily think it's a broken strategy. Um, Mike's deck was just really well executed and he got more or less everything he could have wanted. So in that case, you know, any deck that manages to pull that off would be expected to do very well or win. And um, nothing that his deck did was like broken uh, in, in the sense that it was working un in an unintended way or it was uh, unexpectedly or unfairly more powerful than the other decks in the event. Yeah, well said. Um, but yeah, I was interested to hear how the Q Builder perceives these decks too, because I mean, you're experiencing this just in a different way, right? Because you're also seeing these, you, know, you you put these cards in here, so you have an agenda behind it, but then you see how they're getting used. So it's interesting to see how that um, then kind of evolves and forms your opinion. So that's really cool. Um, I'm definitely interested to see how the uh, cube adapts over time. And I think our closing segment is coming to a close. Uh, Mike, do you have any last thoughts, anything you want to say before we sign off? I uh, just want to say uh, thanks for running the event. And it, that event was a lot of fun. It was well ran. And it was a lot of fun looking back on the VODs. And I appreciate that. Yeah, it was great. To, and you know, you guys are providing us with content too, since you, we had to film the great players played, right? So <laughs> you play, you played a role in that. Um, so yeah, I mean, again, once again, Mike, thanks for coming on our first guest on P Cube. Hopefully, more to come in the future. Uh, Mike, do you have a Twitter or anything that people could find uh, find you on? Uh, just no. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I if you wanted to like talk to me more just message me on discord or find me on facebook um just mike gives <laughs> I, I don't really have a uh, any social media really like for okay. pokemon related stuff but yeah fair enough mike well it's a mike is an admin on the pokemon tcg cube discord as well so you can very easily find him there um you don't have to necessarily like reach out to him individually he's not not hard to find <laughs> No. Very accessible. Well, great. I just wanted to make sure people knew where to find you because obviously everyone's going to want to know about your cube deck, right? So uh, <laughs> make sure we can get the word out. But I think that's going to do it for this episode. Uh, once again, thank you so much for listening. And if you're on the YouTube, uh, make sure to check out our other videos. We do have VODs from all of the week two games from Champions Cubes. And if you want to watch more of Mike's run, definitely check out that. But that is going to wrap it up for this episode. You've been listening to Peak Cube, the one and only Pokemon Cube content podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Martin, brought to you with Connor Lavelle, and we'll see you guys next time.